Good evening, colleagues. We are going to do the final session of the day. It's going to be the Claude Ake presidential lecture. Um, since you've been so tolerant and since you've been so nice to us, we wanted to offer you a piece of music by Mr. Osman Fall before the lecture begins. Mr. Fall. Bonjour, cher grand public. C'est avec euh, énorme plaisir que je viens remplir cette tâche qui m'est confiée par la direction de Codesia ici à Dakar. Il s'agit de faire des prestations instrumentales durant tout le long de votre séjour. Merci de m'avoir fait confiance. Ça fait vraiment plaisir d'être en collaboration avec le Codestria ici à Dakar. J'espère que les notes que je vais jouer vont vous plaire. En tout cas, le premier jour, les gens qui étaient là, j'ai senti que les notes leur ont bien plu. Et je compte continuer dans cette dynamique pour vous faire plaisir durant tout le long de votre séjour ici. You are the most welcome. <laughs> bon, pour ce soir, je vais vous jouer une chanson euh, qui date de très longues années. Cette chanson s'intitule Tubaka. Tubaka était un, était un surnom qu'on a donné à un danseur qui n'était pas du tout griot. Et vous saviez qu'au passé, la danse et les chansons étaient destinées aux griots. Et bon, comme euh, la musique, en général, c'est un euh, virus qui peut piquer n'importe qui. <rire> Et moi qui vous parle, en l'occurrence, parce que je ne suis pas du tout griot, mais quand même, c'est les griots qui nous ont appris à jouer la chora. Et je suis aussi d'une famille musicienne, commençant par mon père, qui fut le fameux guitariste de Baba Mal. Et mon, frère, mon, 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 mon grand frère, Amadou Fall, qui a été aussi le joueur de Cora de Baba Mal. Je suis étudiant ici même à Lucat, mais bon, le destin, le destin a fait que je suis devenu un joueur de Cora maintenant. Je suis passé de côté des études. <rire> bon, revenons à notre son, Toubaka. Euh, ce jeune homme qu'on a donné le nom de Toubaka parce qu'il il, il dansait et il chantait en même temps était un gars qui fut euh, détesté par sa famille parce qu'il n'était pas griot. Et par l'intermédiaire de son frère, Khalil, il fut expulsé, expulsé de leur village à cause du métier qu'il exerçait. C'est dans ce contexte que ce son que je voudrais jouer devant vous a été créé. Merci de bien écouter les chansons. <rire> Thank you. 
Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Fall. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Fall. J'espère que le morceau uh, va vous aider à un peu oublier tous les problèmes que vous avez eus depuis votre arrivée à Dakar. Et va vous aider à pardonner le code SREA pour tous les problèmes. Son Excellence Président Stabou Mbeki, chers collègues, Professeur Colomfoué, le Président adjoint de code SREA. Excellence, euh, Monsieur le Président, je voudrais d'abord euh, vous remercier euh, d'être une fois de plus euh, avec nous euh, dans cette euh, salle. Vous êtes euh, venu euh, nous témoigner votre euh, affection et euh, bien entendu euh, votre soutien. Nous vous en sommes euh, extrêmement euh, reconnaissants. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers amis, good afternoon, bonsoir, bon dia. Honorer euh, ceux des membres d'une communauté euh, qui ont euh, beaucoup œuvré pour le bien commun est un devoir d'humanité. Honorer la mémoire de nos morts illustres constitue pour les vivants une manière de rendre leurs âmes immortelles. Car vous le savez autant que moi, dans la tradition africaine, l'accès à l'immortalité n'est pas inconditionnel. Euh, en Afrique et depuis l'Égypte antique, l'immortalité est conditionnelle. Euh, parce que seules les âmes qui ont subi avec euh, succès l'épreuve de la pesée devant le tribunal d'Osiris, comme cela se disait euh, à l'époque, sont susceptibles euh, d'accéder à ces privilèges. Le comité exécutif du Colisérien a donc accordé ses privilèges à Claude Ake, un ancien président du Colisérien au milieu des années 80. Qui est Claude Ake Claude Ake est né en 1939. Il a été arraché très tôt à notre affection en 1996. Donc, il est mort à l'âge de 56 ans. Claude Ake était un politologue nigérian distingué. Il était, vous le savez sans doute, originaire de Moku. Claude Ake est l'une des grandes figures de la philosophie politique africaine. Il était, vous le savez sans doute aussi, et en tout cas on le rappelle pour les jeunes générations, il était spécialiste de l'économie politique. Il a beaucoup travaillé sur les questions de développement. Claude Ake a été doyen de la faculté des sciences sociales de l'Université de Porte Harcourt. Claude Ake a connu une riche carrière internationale parce qu'il a enseigné dans différentes universités à travers le monde. Notamment, il a enseigné à l'Université de Yale aux États-Unis, à l'Université de Nairobi au Kenya, à l'Université de Dar es Salaam en Tanzanie. Bien entendu aussi à l'université de Porte Harcourt. Euh, Claude Aquet n'était pas seulement un académicien euh, distingué, c'est quelqu'un qui savait également payer de sa personne, parce que euh, c'était un militant euh, euh, politique. Euh, militant politique, euh, il s'est beaucoup engagé 
euh, dans les luttes euh, sociales et politiques euh, de son pays. Et on se rappelle très bien euh, ses prises de position extrêmement euh, fortes euh, sur euh, les questions environnementales qui euh, minent euh, le, le delta du Niger depuis euh, très très longtemps déjà et euh, qui euh, sont à l'origine euh, de euh, l'exécution en 1995 de Ken euh, Sarouya. Et euh, vous savez qu'à euh, cette époque-là, euh, Claude Ake avait pris euh, des positions extrêmement euh, fermes pour euh, condamner euh, cette euh, exécution de Ken Sarouya. Euh, Claude Ake euh, a beaucoup euh, publié. Et euh, c'est la raison pour laquelle euh, la communauté euh, euh, scientifique euh, africaine et mondiale a tenu à euh, l'honorer. Euh, 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 Cloraquet est honoré non seulement euh, en Afrique, mais euh, également euh, à travers le monde. Et euh, c'est la raison pour laquelle le département euh, de la recherche sur euh, la paix et euh, les conflits de l'Université d'Uppsala en, en Suède, en collaboration avec euh, le Nordic African, euh, Africa Institute, euh, a consacré, a créé une chaire euh, Claude euh, Ake. Et j'encourage d'ailleurs euh, les euh, chercheurs euh, qui sont dans cette salle et euh, par-delà euh, ces chercheurs, tous les, tous les chercheurs africains, eh bien, euh, de postuler parce que euh, cette chaire euh, accorde euh, des bourses extrêmement euh, intéressantes. Donc, pour nous, euh, Claude Ake, c'est un motif euh, de fierté et qu'il soit ainsi reconnu euh, à l'échelle euh, internationale et qu'on lui consacre une chaire, eh bien, euh, cela constitue pour nous euh, un grand motif euh, de fierté. Alors, nous avons euh, consacré euh, cette séance à Claude euh, Ake, comme euh, nous avons consacré euh, euh, d'autres séances à euh, d'autres euh, illustres euh, disparus. Eh bien, pour cette séance, nous ne sommes pas allés chercher euh, très loin. Euh, nous nous sommes dit qu'il fallait que L'un des successeurs, l'une des successeurs de euh, Claude Ake, euh, au poste de euh, président euh, du Corsillac, que cet hommage-là soit rendu par l'un de ses successeurs. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous avons euh, prié euh, Madame le professeur euh, Jodi euh, Chika, euh, Chikata, euh, actuelle présidente euh, du Corsillac, eh bien, de rendre euh, hommage euh, à Claude Ake à travers une conférence qu'elle va euh, délivrer euh, euh, à, à l'instant même. Alors, euh, Madame euh, le professeur, euh, chers collègues, euh, chers amis, je voudrais vous inviter euh, sur ce pupitre pour vous adresser à la communauté euh, africaine et des sciences sociales. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Prof. Nkolosi. Good evening. H.E. President Tabumbeki, dear colleagues, first and foremost, I want to thank you most sincerely for staying the course. I think we've had a very long day, so um, I am especially appreciative that you, still, you are still here to, to listen uh, to this lecture. The one person I most keenly regret is not here at this lecture, and to whom I dedicate this effort is Sam Moyo, mentor, comrade, and brother. Sam, who in addition to his prodigious scholarship on agrarian change in Africa and Zimbabwe, and his mentoring of a whole new generation of intellectuals, was the moving spirit behind the Agrarian South Network a thriving tri-continental network of progressive agrarian scholars and activists from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Many of his leading African members, including myself, Isa Shivji, Fred Hendricks, and Leno Somme, to name only a few, share a primary kinship forged at Cordesia. To my mind, this is only one more example of Cordesia's pivotal role in fostering new networks and partnerships, a function which places Cordestria at the center of intellectual endeavor within the social sciences and the humanities in Africa. It is only appropriate that this is the Claude Ake lecture. 
I never had the good fortune of meeting Claude Aki in person, and I'm probably the first president of Kodesha not to have done so. However, he's still a household name in the social sciences for his work on democracy and development in Africa, and is considered by some to be one of Africa's foremost political philosophers. So of course, I've encountered his work. We read in him as I contemplated my lecture. I've been struck by his courageous efforts at theorizing important subjects such as development and class relations in Africa's social formations. Most pertinent for this lecture is his article titled Notes on the Political Economy of Unemployment in Africa where he addresses one of the most challenging and troubling questions we face today as a continent, the crisis of unemployment and the informalization of work and the concomitant waste of young lives and the ingenuity and spirit of the working peoples of Africa. Aken notes that the integral nature of the relationship between rural and urban unemployment raising one of the key questions that concerns me in this lecture, which is the labor conditions of agrarian production systems and their threats to meaningful agrarian transformation. While he also flags questions of youth unemployment and the situation of women, he does not quite integrate these two lines of inquiry in the analysis he offers. Less important than what is not there is what this effort represents, a timeless call to continue to produce relevant and critical knowledge that we should heed in our responsibility as African scholars. Beyond his scholarship, and this is something Claude Ake shared with some, was Ake's firm commitment to chronicling the daily struggles of the working peoples of Africa in their social movements, while using his scholarship to support their strivings for a better life through policy engagement. Sadly, they were both rudely taken from us at the height of their powers. When their projects, the Center for Advanced Social Science in Port Harcourt and the African Institute for Agrarian Studies in Harare were beginning to gain influence and recognition for their contributions to knowledge production and their support for social movements. The subject matter of my lecture, the land and labor questions of agrarian transformation in Africa, is inspired by renewed concerns about the future of Africa's agriculture and its role in achieving structural transformation of economies of sub-Saharan Africa when it is in a state of stagnation dominated by poor smallholders in most African countries. In addition, I want to draw attention to the domination of this debate by European and American scholars. This is certainly a factor in the questions that have dominated debates on agrarian change, irrespective of the orientation and intention of the scholars involved. I believe that a more robust participation of African scholarship in these debates could bring urgency to the debate and different questions to the fore. Given the traditions of historical and textured agrarian scholarship pioneered by Achima Seji, Desalen Ramato, Samoyo, and Kojo Amano, to name only a few. This scholarship involved careful examination of what was actually happening in the African countryside and was not blinded by productivity statistics. This together with a more recent feminist scholarship on land and agrarian issues by Marjorie Mbilini, Zenet Tadese, Leno Somme, and several others are very good foundations on which to build an understanding of agrarian change. In what follows, I discuss recent dis developments in the scientific and policy context of agrarian studies, identify some of the land and labor issues that should inform the debates about the future and make suggestions for what questions future research could begin to address. The current policy and scientific context of agrarian studies is a much more varied and contested space than it was in the 1980s when neoliberalism was on the ascendancy. The Lagos plan of action was inundated and buried by counter narratives and policies of economic liberalization and the reorganization and consolidation of Africa's role as a producer of agricultural commodities and extractives in the International Division of Labor. In the current context we have now, the AU's Agenda 2063 commits to structural transformation and the modernization of agriculture as part of the achievement of its first aspiration, a prosperous Africa 
based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. As well, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, CADEP, launched in 2002, seeks to enhance growth in agriculture and address the issues of poverty reduction and food insecurity in Africa. In 2003, these goals and CADEP in general were adopted by the heads of state of Af the African Union in the Maputo Declaration on Food Security and Agriculture in Africa and in, in the 2014 Malabo Declaration on Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Transformation. The Maputo Declaration calls for a minimum allocation of 10% of national budgets to agriculture and a commitment by countries to undertake activities that will result in an annual growth rate of 6% for the sector. Although much criticized for its neoliberal underpinnings and for only paying lip service to smallholder agriculture, for the central role it gives to external partners and donors, the top-down government donor policy making it champions and the failure of most African countries to achieve the 10% investment target there's no doubt that CADIP has been a catalyst for sub-regional and national agricultural policy reforms and has entrenched agrarian transformation and industrialization as legitimate goals for African countries, albeit through market reforms. These policy developments in agriculture have been accompanied by new instruments such as the Africa Mining Vision and the Continental Free Trade Agreement. They provide some counterpoints and entry points for policy contests and for scholarly debates about agriculture in Africa. However, agricultural policy in African countries continues to be neoliberal with a clear preference for large-scale commercial agriculture and is aid-dependent, thus ceding policy space to donors. The USAID and the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, are in, are in charge of important aspects of agricultural policy in a country like Ghana through providing aid to the policy drafting process and subsequently paying selectively for policy implementation. In the countryside, policy making and implementation is under the control of transnational corporations involved in agriculture as producers, as buyers of commodities, and as traders in agrochemicals and inputs. In relation to the scholarly context, Recent developments in agrarian studies, a branch of scholarship that has been in steady decline in Africa for decades, in spite of the salience of its subject matter to our continent's current conditions and future are pertinent. The current explosion of scholarship of agrarian, on, on, about agrarian change in Africa by European and American scholars in what is known and cherished by many African universities as international journals is very striking. Outlets such as the Journal of Peasant Studies are thriving on the basis of such scholarship. In addition to a small group of dedicated scholars of agrarian change who are mostly based in South Africa, there's a new generation of African scholars beginning to turn their attention to this matter, and this is very good news. However, the renewed interest in agrarian transformation does not yet have the momentum that an earlier period of research on this subject had. Before the 1980s, interest in agrarian transformation had been propelled by the fact that newly independent African countries prioritized agriculture and rural development under the influence of ascendant farmers' organizations, hoping to reap the benefits of independence. Secondly, agrarian studies in the social sciences does not have the influence and legitimacy of the research in the agricultural sciences, which has grown in leaps and bounds within large and stable research networks that span the globe and supported by awards of millions of research dollars over several decades. The success of these branches of knowledge, perhaps, is perhaps because they are more suited to the purposes of agribusiness, governments, and donors in their focus on practical questions of soil quality, improved seeds and other technologies, new plant varieties, hydrology, and agro-processing. While they pay attention to the diffusion of innovations and are exercised by farmers' poor responses to new technologies, issues of the conditions under which farmers produce, in particular the question of land and labor, rarely engage their attention. The one shared concern of the natural sciences and the social sciences is productivity. While yields and productivity are certainly important, they need to be studied as part of the broader question 
of the social reproduction of farming households. This would examine the issue of who benefits from particular approaches to increase productivity. How do different approaches to improving productivity structure how the benefits are shared? Which approaches and measures would best support the social reproduction of farm households and their members, the production system, as well as the agrarian political economy? These issues certainly do not attract sufficient attention in discussions of productivity. Also importantly, in addition, in addition to generating intractable debates about which skills of farming are the most productive and therefore most deserving of policy support and resources among large, medium, and small-scale farming. The focus on productivity has also framed discussions about women farmers in two ways. It has been used to justify policy efforts and expenditures on promoting women's access to productive resources. Proponents have argued that agriculture will benefit immensely from addressing women's resource and time constraints. An often cited stylized fact is that reducing gen gender inequalities in access to physical capital, inputs, and human capital would increase the productivity of Africa's agriculture by 10 to 20 percent. This has been replicated by a number of World Bank country studies from Kenya, Burkina Faso, Tanzania, and Zambia used by the World Bank, FAO, and IFAD in a, a gender and agricultural source book. These studies predict yield increases if women get more land, labor inputs, capital investments, and have their time burdens reduced. A related debate has been about how the productivity of women farm, uh, has been about the productivity of women farmers and what makes their farms more or less or equally productive as male farmers. Feminist scholars have long debated the instrumentalist arguments derived from such research. On the one hand, instrumentalist arguments have proved useful in negotiating with a wide range of actors, and they are easier to sell to powerful patriarchal institutions than rights and citizenship arguments. However, they have also generated intractable controversies, and in any case, do not answer certain vital questions about the gendered nature of production systems and the processes of agrarian change. The recent best in scholarship in agrarian transformation can be dated roughly to a signal development in neoliberal globalization. When a subprime mortgage default crisis that hit banks and poor people in the US morphed into a global capital, food, and energy crisis that peaked in 2007, 2008. The triple crisis resulted in a search for new sites for real and speculative investments of financial capital in the search of ever more profits and also to address some of the elements of the crisis. Acquisitions of unutilized farmlands on land abandoned continents became the new investment of choice and Africa the destination of choice. Whether the assessment that Africa's land is abundant with underutilized land is correct is another matter which also has its own debates. Mafejo, for example, has long dismissed this, arguing that there's not much unutilized land in Africa as is being made out. One, because of the patterns of settlement that are quite dense in certain parts of, of, of Africa, as well as farming practices with inbuilt fallow systems, as well as the serious problems of soil fragility arising from the introduction of agricultural commodities that are cultivated as monocultures. The fact that this discourse about land abundance was resurrected in a moment of global crisis should engage our scholarly attention. The search for land, variously called land grabbing, the land rush, and more descriptively, large-scale land acquisitions, involved the usual suspects, transnational corporations and agribusinesses from the global north, but also new players, which included governments and companies from the global south, such as China, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, as well as companies from the EU, the United States, India, and South Africa. The places where the largest acquisitions occurred in Africa were Sudan, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Madagascar, and the DRC. With regard to skill, the acquisitions um, have been um, have been said to cover millions of hectares. FOO says 20 million hectares were acquired in three years. Um, somebody else puts it as 30 million out of a figure of 37 million hectares for all acquisitions since 2008. 
Unfortunately, these figures have become a moving target because apart from being overtaken by time and the difficulties of collation, some acquisitions were under negotiation, some were acquired but not used, while others were in use with business models that involved locals as contracts farming. The authors of the much debated land matrix that tried to establish the scale and range of these acquisitions using an observatory approach, which involved inviting information from around the world, has complained bitterly about the secrecy surrounding some of these acquisitions. That acquiring such large tracts of land, and by extension, taking control of water sources in Africa to feed people on other continents was not controversial. It's a mark of how the economic imperatives of globalization have changed the terms of intellectual and policy debate. It was not problematic to target another continent's resources if you could point to real or imagined mutual benefits, such as food security, or to the greater good, such as stabilizing global food markets. This approach to Africa's resources is not limited to land for food. The term resource nationalism is now being used pejoratively to describe, this, to describe state efforts to control the use of natural resources on their territory. The pro-business outlet, news outlet, CMBS, has on its website a 2040 article published in a section called The World's Biggest Risks, which defines resource nationalism and warns that it may be increasing in, in terms that leave no doubt that this is not a good development. I'd like to quote what they said. Resource nationalism describes a government's effort to gain greater benefit from its natural resources, sometimes to the detriment of private companies. This can range from outright expropriation, when a government takes away a company's assets, or to more creeping forms of appropriation, such as higher taxation or more arduous regulation. This is an article written by a Jessica Morris. In an outline course for A-level students online, resource nationalism is described by quoting someone called Andy Miller, described as a global tax leader, mining and metals from Ernst and Young. And he says, resource nationalism has become a contagion, impacting the mining and metals industry across the globe. The industry needs to become more engaged in the analysis and management of this risk which can place a heavy burden on existing operations and influence future decisions on where to invest. And the, the um, document goes on to cite examples of resource nationalism in Africa, which include South Africa's efforts to uh, tax windfall uh, profits on coal and platinum, Ghana's efforts to tax diamond and gold profits, and Australia's efforts in the areas of iron ore, nickel, and coal. For whom, one might ask, is resource nationalism a risk to be mitigated? The idea that others have no qualms about identifying Africa's natural resources as an important aspect of their own strategies for development, while troubling, is not surprising, as it has been possible for others to acquire what they need in Africa on their own terms since before colonization. As Moyo and his colleagues wrote about land grabbing, this was the third scramble for land in Africa, the first being Africa's partition in 1884 and the different forms of colonization and land dispossession the continent experienced, and the second being the scramble for land in the 1980s when economic liberalization policies intensified resource extraction and infrastructural projects leading to more land dispossession and land use conflicts. The analysis offered by Moyo and his colleagues and several others drew attention to the long-standing control of Africa's economies generally and agriculture specifically by transnational capital, reinforced by the global economic governance regime as an important feature of globalization. The dominant framework de devised by Western scholars for analyzing land grabs was a list of drivers that kept on multiplying as the time went on. There was also an interest in which companies and governments were involved, which countries and continents were the most affected, and what quantum of land had been acquired in the terms of the acquisitions, the business models, and their interface with local producers, and how governments, traditional leaders, and the local elites were responding, how farmers and civil society groups were responding, and the effects of acquisitions on local production and agrarian economies. 
Since much of the recent scholarship was made possible by funding from Western donor sources, African researchers played catch up as members of research consortia led mainly by European researchers. The research on land grabbing on the basis of an auto-critique of the first and second round of studies soon turned to studies of models of agricultural commercialization and their merits and demerits. And it led to a re-appreciation re of contract farming as the best win-win strategy for African farmers and transnational capital. This new lease of life of, for contract farming does not focus on its histories and itineraries and is not engaged in a critical assessment of the voluntary standards and corporate social responsibility activities of transnational corporations, which have enabled them to acquire the social license to operate in potentially hostile territories. Meanwhile, a strand of the scholarship is focused on challenging arguments about privileging support for smallholder agriculture. I've taken a random piece of writing by a highly cited scholar of agrarian studies, Dirkon. It's a working paper published by a very influential note of, Afri of scholarship on Africa, the Center for the Study of African Economies at Oxford University, titled Agriculture and Africa's Development, a Review of Theories and Strategies, to illustrate my point about how different questions can lead to different answers. Dirkon and Golin write in magisterial tones, and I quote them here. Many previous authors have argued that Africa's development strategies must focus on agriculture because the sector is large and important. We find this line of argument deeply unconvincing. Even if the sector is vast, and even if it employs large numbers of people, the critical question must be whether there are useful and feasible interventions that the public sector can take to promote growth and equity through agriculture that are superior to other feasible interventions and policies. Others argue that agriculture matters as a supplier of food, an essential good, or that agricultural development is the key to reducing poverty and inequality. While understanding fully the arguments that support these ideas, we note again that the question of public policy is ultimately whether resources invested in agriculture achieve development objectives more cost-effectively than the same resources invested elsewhere in the economy. If growth in agriculture is especially difficult to achieve, then the development strategy concentrating on agricultural investment may lead only to wasteful expenditures of resources. This paper does not conclude that agriculture is not an appropriate sector for strategic investment, nor are we opposed in any sense to policies that would prioritize this sector. We simply argue that there's little evidence that will support or oppose the claim that public investment in agriculture will generate greater improvements in social welfare than investments in other sectors." Unquote. I think these authors have turned the real question on its head to reach this agnostic and cavalier approach to a situation which is no joking matter. It is not that we need to convince ourselves that investing in peasants is the best approach to agriculture because it has never actually been consistently and fully done before. So this is not a question that can actually be answered. What we can answer though and should focus on is whether agriculture and neoliberalism can actually deliver de decent life use and structural transformation in Africa. Now contrast this view from Dekon and his colleague to a view from ASSET, the African Center for Economic Transformation. This is um, a center which is quite neoliberal in its view. It writes in its flagship report, African Transformation Report, subtitled Agriculture Powering Africa's Economic Transformation. And again, I quote them to, to make the point. For the most part, agriculture in Africa remains backward and tied to a commodity exporting model that countries are trying to move away from. Yet, many, yet for many countries, agriculture presents the easiest path to industrialization and economic transformation. Increasing productivity and output in a modern agricultural sector would beyond improving food security and the balance of payments through reduced food imports and increased exports, sustain agro-processing, the manufacturing of agricultural inputs, and a host of up services upstream and downstream from farms, creating employment and boosting incomes across the country. 
Many of today's successful economies follow that path to economic transformation. It is even more relevant for Africa today, given its factor endowments and emerging global trends in manufacturing technology, demand patterns, and the location decisions of lead firms in global value chains. These global trends are making an industrialization strategy based on exports of labor-intensive manufacturers used so successfully in East Asia more difficult. Fortunately, African countries can combine that strat strategy with one based on modernizing agriculture and developing agro-based manufacturing and services. African countries have the opportunity to pursue a dual track to industrialization. One track that leverages their relative labor abundance for labor intensive and export oriented light manufacturing. And another track that leverages the advantages in agriculture for global competitive agriculturally based manufacturing. These two tracks are complementary and reinforce each other, unquote. Although the asset report makes recommendations that repeat tired notions that smallholder farmers lack business sense, something long refuted by the smallholders responsible for the successes of primary commodity production in Ghana, Kenya, and Ethiopia, to name only a few. It is significant that an African think tank intuitively understands that smallholders must feature in any credible approach to agrarian transformation. Given that the point of agrarian transformation defined by asset as a process that incorporates two main processes, transforming or modernizing farming by boosting productivity and running farms as modern businesses and strengthening the links between farms and other economic sectors in a mutually beneficial process, whereby farm outputs support manufacturing through agro-processing and other sectors support farming by pro providing modern manufactured inputs and services, is to address the endemic questions of rural poverty and underdevelopment and uplift the Africa's majority smallholder farmers. I would argue that to engage with these recommendations, we need a clearer understanding of the global, national, and local context in which farmers operate the nature of agrarian stagnation and the increasing differentiation in the agrarian economy, as well as the most important challenges farmers face. Most pertinent in this regard are the current land and labor questions, and understanding how these issues affect the social reproduction of ag the agrarian political economy is critical for the ability of African social sciences to begin to pronounce authoritatively on what is needed to change the conditions of the men, women, and children who constitute Africa's agrarian citizen workers and support their efforts to thrive after decades of catastrophic neglect and harmful national and global e economic policy and governance frameworks. So now I want to turn my attention to some of the agrarian and political, and some of the agrarian, the land and labor questions of the agrarian political economy. In earlier work on gender and agrarian change, I have argued that it is difficult to disentangle completely land from labor questions in the agrarian political economy. This is because land questions have labor ramifications and vice versa. As well, many of the social categories and social relations generated by the analysis of social reproduction, class, gender, kinship, and terms such as peasant, proletariat, and semi-proletariat, all carry signifiers related to both land and labor relations. As well, agricultural ten tenancies that characterize smallholder and middle scale agriculture are land and labor exchanges, as is contract farming. Therefore, I intend to address both questions as they arise in my narrative. The main features of the agrarian political economy in much of Sub-Saharan Africa were established in the colonial period when the drive for export commodities fueled the commercialization of agriculture, mining, and other resource extraction activities. These developments created land and labor markets and a growing social differentiation, albeit with specificities for the different three main types of colonial economic arrangements identified by Samia Amin long ago. Smallholder economies, mainly in West, and, uh, in West Africa and parts of Eastern and Southern Africa, the plantation economies mainly in Central Africa and settler economies mainly in East and Southern Africa. These were distinguished by their levels of land concentration and inequalities in the size of land holdings, 
the character of their labor regimes and by the extent to which they use forced labor, wage employment, and labor migration, and also by their levels of smallholder landlessness. These processes which restructured the agrarian production system were gendered. Men and women were involved in this system through a sexual division of labor underpinned by kinship and domestic arrangements. They exchanged labor both within and outside households. Within households, women's subordination was manifested by their labor obligations to husbands and other senior males. Thus, many women combined independent farming with unpaid labor for others. These two aspects of women's work had very different economic and social ramifications and contributed differently to women's livelihood portfolios. While independent work contributed outputs and incomes controlled by women, working for others together with their reproductive labor contributed general rights of welfare. Combined with the separation of spousal purses and resources, this resulted in separate resource streams and responsibilities divided by convention within specific production systems across Africa. These differences in colonial histories are reflected in post-colonial economic arrangements and arrangement, post-colonial agrarian economies across Africa. And they can actually be distinguished today by the extent of large-scale commercial agriculture, the development of formal land markets, as well as levels of income inequalities and stages of agrarian transformation. However, post-colonial development since the 1980s, particularly in the 1990s, have begun to blur some of these distinctions. When far-reaching economic liberalization of macroeconomic and sectoral policies supported by land tenure reforms promoting titling and registration of land and the liberalization of land markets were instituted across Africa. A common feature of agrarian change in Africa has been the growth in diversification of agrarian livelihood strategies and activities. More recently, it's been observed that in rural areas, households often struggle, straddle agrarian and non-agrarian livelihood activities or try to make a living in both rural and urban areas. Others have returned to take up activities or new opportunities in the countryside, such as land redistribution. The countryside in Africa is also home to labor, which is less dependent on earnings from agriculture, but not easily absorbed within the non-farm economy. This is also the case in countries with fairly advanced agrarian transitions, such as South Africa, where rural people's strategies for survival combined straddling of rural and urban spaces with formal and informal sources of income and state-sponsored social protection. As Dutoit and Neves note, even in situations of agrarian transitions, agricultural self-provisioning remains an important part of the livelihood portfolio. An important feature in this current period is a growing incidence of land use conflicts across Africa. There are conflicts between sedentary farmers and pastoralists, and these are becoming endemic, and they are a threat to national integration. There are also conflicts among the uses of land, such as farming, natural resource extraction, peri-urban housing, and infrastructural development in the absence of land use planning and the prioritization of, of, of use. And this has had major disruptive effects. Even more importantly, the refereeing of such conflicts shows up the post-colonial states' destructive and corrupt alliances with foreign capital, national elite, chiefs, and traditional leaders to the detriment of large armies of dispossessed and neglected citizens. Citizens' responses have called forth the coercive power of the state, often dressed up in the rhetoric of law and order. It galvanizes centrifugal forces that strengthen discourses about who is a citizen, who are autochtones, who are alloctones, and therefore deserve to be dispossessed. Communities facing dispossession sometimes express themselves in the language of protecting culture and tradition, thus threatening the already tenuous land interests of women, young persons, and migrants, and often strengthening the control of chiefs and traditional rulers who increasingly have privatized what used to be called communal rights in land as a strategy of accumulation. Africa's vulnerability to the deleterious effects on climate change is tied up with the importance of agriculture to African economies, as well as the dominant technologies of Africa's agriculture. The problem is not that Africa lacks the ability to respond or adapt to the impacts of cli climate change. 
The basic technologies of African agriculture, the long fallow periods, dispersed plots, the preference for drought resistant species, labor exchanges are all examples of successful adaptation and innovation. The challenge farmers face now is a new round of adaptations they are required to make after taking up technologies and practices that have sapped the resilience of African agriculture. Mafeji, for example, has drawn attention to the effects of monocropping on fragile soils, and others have drawn attention to the food security deficits of monoculture. Others have also drawn attention to the time constraints created by adopting seeds that demand fertilizer, agrochemicals, constant attention, and, and, and so on, which also put pressure on already depleted water sources. Climate change is an urgent matter because it adds a layer of complexity to the issues farmers face and to their capacity, the capacity of the agrarian systems to survive and thrive and guarantee the reproduction of households. It also offers another powerful illustration of how the International Division of Labor and the actions of the industrialized North and the global South and international agreements mitigate the, efforts, the effects of climate change and will affect what is possible for Africa in its quest for structural transformation through industrialization. One troubling issue is that Africa's agriculture's contribution to GDP in Africa has been diminishing over the past four decades, and yet it continues to be the single most important source of employment in, 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 in Africa. And this is, this is um, a paradox which one um, has to pay attention to because the, 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 the move from agriculture to low productivity work in, in, this, in the services sector, which has replaced agriculture, um, it, it has been because agriculture is suffering stagnation and is shedding labor and not because of improved productivity and alternatives of off-farm employment in agriculture. The land and labor relations of agrarian production are underpinned by unpaid reproductive work within the care economy. This is invisible, and it has contributed in no small way to the long-standing care deficits caused by the lack of public investments in care. It is well known that the responsibility for home-based care and domestic work, as well as the task of ameliorating the care deficits of public institutions, such as healthcare centers, falls mainly on women and girls, who are also heavily involved in unpaid household-based production. Sub-Saharan Africa has a very low coverage of health institu care institutions, and yet has some of the highest numbers of children needing care per household. Secondly, rural Africa has few technologies for reducing the drudgery of domestic work, with distances to water and fuel wood growing because of land dispossession, the privatization of the commons and climate change. Moreover, household expenditures do not prioritize technologies to ease domestic work. The effects of the care deficits are both short and long term. Together with the gender segmentation of productive work, it has an adverse effect on women's earnings and the ability to grow their enterprises and acquire assets and make financial contributions to their households. In the long term, it undermines the conditions for the reproduction of a healthy and skilled labor force. So, looking forward now, how can Africa's social sciences address um, some of these questions? More than ever before, Africa's social sciences are needed in this discussion of agrarian transformation. We need to build the networks and to raise the resources to enable some critical, comparative, and long-term basic policy relevant studies to take place. Different levels of empirical work and theorizing are needed, and forging relationships with other African and global South networks would be most imaginative and resourceful. An innovation could, be, could involve partnerships with social scientists. It has become clear to me that some of the most successful agrarian scholars have, much, have been aided by their practical understanding of farming systems and agronomy. We need to change the research questions as well, from the static questions to questions which can study the entire political economy while enabling us to plot the responses of farmers 
and some of the signal changes taking place in the agrarian countryside. We should also prioritize um, what we need to change to ensure that farmers can reproduce themselves and their households, not in survival mode, but in modes that allow them to thrive. Our questions should also address social differentiation, as well as changing the land and labor relations and their implications. Our studies should also keep in mind the international governance and trade dimensions of agriculture, because they frame actually what is possible in our agrarian um, policies. As well, the strict separation between land use for agriculture and mining and infrastructure in discussions of land concentration are not helpful, and they provide us only a partial understanding of what's going on around the land um, system. Above all, we have to subject our efforts to theorize and identify social categories to the ruthless criticism of everything. That was the hallmark of Mathege's scholarship. He demanded that African realities not be shoehorned into Eurocentric concepts of class and agrarian change. This call to creativity should influence how we see women in these categories, giving women and men's very different insertions into the international division of labor, and women's unpaid work to subsidize capital and their subordination to patriarchal structures. Do the categories of peasant, semi-proletariat, and proletariat apply to them in their strict definitions? I suspect not. These are urgent tasks, but they are tasks which are for the long haul if we mean to accompany the quest for the kind of structural transformation that Africa aspires to. Thank you very much. Merci infiniment, euh, Madame le Professeur, Madame la Présidente, pour euh, ce brillant euh, exposé. En écoutant euh, cette présentation, on a envie de se poser euh, la question que euh, la conférencière elle-même a posée, la question du manque de légitimité de euh, la question euh, agraire, la question de l'économie. Elle a utilisé ce beau terme-là, euh, madame le professeur, je l'ai beaucoup apprécié, l'économie politique euh, agraire et agricole. Je crois qu'il s'agit là du concept euh, clé. Alors cela signifie, euh, de mon point de vue, quelque chose d'extrêmement euh, important. Euh, L'agriculture, ce n'est pas simplement une affaire d'ingénierie. Ce n'est pas seulement le problème des ingénieurs à, 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 à agronomes, mais c'est d'abord un problème euh, politique. C'est un problème d'économie euh, politique. Et euh, toute cette euh, présentation était articulée autour de cette notion clé euh, d'économie euh, politique. Euh, quand on voit surtout euh, les euh, conséquences que le manque de prise en compte de cette dimension de l'agriculture entraîne dans les pays africains. Et la conférencière a beaucoup insisté sur un certain nombre de contradictions. Il y a la grande contradiction entre les sédentaires et les pasteurs. Comment surmonter cette contradiction-là Il y a une autre contradiction fondamentale qui traverse l'ensemble de l'économie agricole de euh, nos pays. C'est euh, la question de l'agrobusiness, de la petite agriculture euh, paysanne. Vous connaissez très, euh, tous euh, les positions fermes de euh, Samir Amin sur euh, ces questions-là. Il y a la question euh, politique, plus seulement de politique euh, euh, intérieure, mais de politique internationale, de euh, l'accaparement euh, de terres. Il s'agit là euh, d'un enjeu extrêmement euh, important, d'une question extrêmement importante dont euh, il faut prendre euh, la mesure. Parce que tout cela entraîne un certain nombre de choses, la prolétarisation de la petite paysannerie, sa paupérisation également. Il y a une autre contradiction sur laquelle la conférencière a beaucoup insisté, c'est celle qui concerne l'opposition entre les autochtones, les halogènes. Vous voyez, c'est des questions extrêmement importantes. Et dans la continuité de ce qui a été dit ce matin, 
par le président euh, Mbeki. Euh, la grande euh, question, euh, la grande question de, euh, de, de subventions agricoles. C'est vrai que euh, Madame euh, le professeur n'a pas directement abordé euh, cette question-là, mais euh, résonnait en moi euh, l'écho de ce que le président Mbeki a dit euh, ce matin sur la grande contradiction entre euh, l'agriculture euh, du Sud et l'agriculture euh, du Nord. Cette agriculture du Nord, n'est-ce pas, qui est protégée et surprotégée par des subventions, alors que euh, l'agriculture de euh, nos pays euh, est euh, pratiquement euh, laissée en euh, déshérence. Donc cela nous permet, une fois de plus, d'interroger euh, la légitimité même euh, des accords de partenariat économique euh, qui sont euh, signés. Alors il y a une question euh, importante, c'était de la chute euh, de euh, cette euh, présentation, mais c'est la place euh, de la femme. Euh, la question euh, du genre, de, de, comme on, on le dit aujourd'hui, euh, la question de euh, l'égalité entre euh, hommes euh, et femmes, la question de l'accès euh, des femmes euh, à la terre. Il s'agit là euh, des problèmes extrêmement importants, tout comme d'ailleurs euh, un problème qui traverse, euh, pas seulement, qui secoue pas seulement euh, les pays de l'Afrique australe, mais euh, également euh, beaucoup de pays en Afrique de l'Ouest, des pays comme, euh, comme euh, la Côte d'Ivoire. N'est-ce pas À qui appartient euh, la terre La terre appartient-elle, n'est-ce pas, aux nationaux euh, seulement Parce qu'il y a un lourd héritage euh, colonial et cet héritage colonial euh, doit être euh, questionné lorsqu'il s'agit euh, d'aborder euh, cette question fondamentale et qui euh, touche à la euh, survie même euh, de l'espèce. On se demande pourquoi, à un moment donné, euh, cette question n'est pas, pas prise au sérieux. Parce que euh, l'être humain est d'abord fait euh, pour... Euh, produire l'existence. On produit l'existence en se nourrissant. Et la production de l'existence commence justement par l'économie agricole, par l'agriculture, parce qu'il faut bien manger pour être en vie. Et cela entraîne, n'est-ce pas, une, la gamme de questions extrêmement excitantes que la conférencière a soulevé dans, dans cette conférence vraiment intéressante. Alors, cela dit, nous allons... Euh, prendre euh, quelques questions pour, euh, bon, disons une quinzaine de minutes. Euh, voilà, euh, professeur, oui. Euh, le micro, s'il vous plaît. Le micro, voilà, ok, merci. I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Chikata for this brilliant uh, lecture. And I think it is uh, one issue which is extremely important for Africa. And uh, I'm happy for uh, the manner in which she described the political economy of agriculture. Uh, this is a, a question that Amilka Cabral deals with in a very, very uh, extremely wonderful manner. Uh, if you read uh, in one of his uh, texts toward the, uh, uh, his uh, lieutenants in the PIGC, a text is entitled uh, Destroy the Economy of the Enemy and Build Our Own Economy. In that text, Cabral provides a very detailed analysis of all the ills pertaining to agriculture in colonial Africa and how we ought to go about changing that so that we can have an agriculture that is uh, directed towards the welfare of the people rather than an agriculture that is based on a colonial exportation of uh, uh, cash crops. Uh, we know in our countries, I come from uh, the DRC. My name is George Zongola. I teach at the University of North Carolina. Um, in the Congo in 1969, President Mobutu declared that agriculture was the priority of priorities. Now, we political scientists, when we hear that, we look at the budget. And we find in the budget that uh, Mr. Mobutu was uh, giving only 1 to 2 percent of the budget to, to agriculture. Uh, why last month was going to defense and many other things. Even to the presidency. The presidency used to have a huge budget. We don't know what he was doing with it. Uh, <laughs> so what we need, uh, as Cabral points out, is to emphasize food production so that people can eat and be healthy. Uh, we have to emphasize maintaining skills. We have many artisans in our uh, rural areas who are making implements to use in agriculture, and all of these are disappearing. 
uh, and now people are you know, limited to using the hoe and the machete. Now with the hoe and the machete alone, you can do much in terms of uh, developing agriculture. Uh, and so I think that the uh, wisdom of Cabral is extremely important and we should use it uh, in terms of looking at uh, what is happening. And this goes to the general issue of political economy uh, and uh, the uh, liberalization we were discussing the last two days. Uh, the fact that we cannot transform Africa if we don't destroy the colonial structures. Because these structures were not built for African people. They were built for the colonial economy and the white settlers. Uh, and if we want to change Africa, we've got to destroy these structures and create structures which are oriented toward improving the livelihood of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Joji. What I want to take home after the, the litany of problems that you listed, what I would like to take home is your solutions. That was very interesting that you proposed some solutions. And my suggestion is for us not to come back here two years later or five years later to come back to the same issue. Is it possible that you as president of Codestria right now, is it possible for you to take your solutions as number one on the agenda of what the Codestria is going to do in the next five years? So that as the author of those solutions, you follow up in such a way that when we come back here in two years or three years time, we have something that we we, 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 can, we can rely on and can we, we can move from there. Because we have been talking too much in Africa. We, we meet, we talk, we talk, we have brilliant uh, brains, very nice solutions, but when we separate, it is business as usual. So it is really time for action. And as the president of Codestria, please, can you put this on the agenda of this institution for the next five years? so that when you come back here, we have concrete results. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, my name is Zebelinga. I would like to emphasize the point that has been raised by our fellow and colleague from DRC. I think there is a perspective that is missing in all what we do maybe. It is the endogenous perspective. Uh, it's very surprising that we talk about rurality, we talk about agriculture, we don't talk about endogenous knowledges, we don't talk about all the production that we, are, that we have in rurality. You have handicraft, you have traditional you know, uh, construction, etc., etc. I just give you one reference, which is a surprising one. In the year 1994, an institution that I will never name Afrocentric one, issued a report. The report was entitled, Africa Can Compete. And uh, the report was talking about handicraft, handicraft exports. And it was made by the World Bank and by Mr. Tyler Bates. And I think that that world perspective is really missing in, in the way we, we discuss economic questions. And if it's missed, it means that a world part of our countries are not included in our reflections on economy. Thank you. Any other question? Bon, il n'y a pas d'autre, il n'y a pas de question. Oui? Ah oui, please. Microphone, please. Okay, thank you for the 
provocative and really stimulating presentation. I'm Namo, I'm from Zimbabwe, that controversial country, which, uh, <laughs> and I, I'm arrested here with uh, issues of land tenure and land ownership to say what would be at this juncture the best form of ownership, especially for the peasants, to say should they get investment for land that they occupy whilst it's communally owned or they have to get some kind of uh, title so that they can also use that same title as collateral to get money from the banks. But here we have to consider that there are these are the big players who can easily come and buy back those titles from the peasantry. So I'm just wondering how best the peasants and the, the, the proletariats, because with proletariats, you also find that there is urban agriculture. Qu quite a number of households in towns are surviving on urban farming, and they utilize urban land. In Zimbabwe, we even talk about uh, colloquially a, a, a dollar land, where people go and pay a dollar to the city council, and they get some kind of rent. So those types of ownership need to be reconsidered, rethought, to say, how best can these people get in money for investment? Because remember, for one to bring technology to agriculture and intensify production, you need resources. And to get those resources, the big farmers have had to rely on banks. And how best can the peasants go about that one? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, Georgie, for the presentation. For me, I think there are key issues that you raised with regards to how African policymakers, together with the technocrats at a particular level, as well as with agencies in the continent, had tried to reimagine African agriculture and how it could be supported and promoted. It looked at various levels of small, medium, and large-scale farmers, but also at different production methods and the issues of access to land and support. Probably the question we need to ask ourselves in respect of CADAP and the commitment that were made by heads of state, what happened at a national and at a continent continental level to ensure that we can monitor the implementation of such commitments. But also how do we strengthen particular policy think tanks? And I think that would be the question for Codestria. You've mentioned the unit, policy unit that was um, established uh, by Sam Moyo, for instance, Ipo Manaza and others. What are we doing to ensure that we can strengthen such think tanks and continue the engagement between intelligentsia as well as the policy makers. Because I think for me that is key. Here in West Africa you had FARA, which was the Forum for Agricultural Researchers, who played a pivotal role in developing CADAP. But what happened thereafter in that engagement between policy makers and your intelligentsia? For me that's the question that an institution such as Codestria needs to reflect on. And lastly, on the issue of land and access. While maybe more in your talk you delve on the agricultural question, but what do we do with urban land and the scarcity for urban development and where in terms of urbanization that expresses the land hunger in a majority of our cities. So how do we deal with those questions that confront us both in terms of agricultural land and land use as well as uh, land for residential and industrial development? Thank you.
no, I just wanted to say that uh, we have very few questions because your uh, lecture was so brilliant. Thank you. Um, what I wanted uh, to add to or just comment on what you had said was that the fact that agriculture has been stagnant and declining, I think has affected the social science community in not engaging, unlike Samoyo, yourself, and a few other scholars on the continent, on engaging on issues of agriculture on the one hand, and as you underlined and emphasized, the issue of labor relations on the other. So um, I want to um, respond to something that was just said, that uh, what do we do with institutions? I think CADEF had raised a very interesting question of the budget, how African uh, budgets should allocate a minimum of 10%. As was said this morning, if we look at African the budget of African countries, very few African countries have met that commitment. And in the meantime, that was made about 10 years ago. <coughs> I'm not even sure if that is sufficient in light of the challenges that you outlined for uh, our engagement in agricultural transformation. Um, the other issue, what I really, really appreciated about your lecture was locating the issue of gender, labor, and youth employment in this lecture. These, I think, are the three very major questions facing our continent. We talk about poverty, we talk about youth employment separately often, and we hardly ever locate it in agricultural transformation, mining, and so forth. What is happening to externalization of our economies and how this is creating a situation of massive unemployment of youth and women who happen to be the over 75% of the population on this continent. So I just wanted to thank you for bringing to the room a very serious challenge. And I'm sure, as uh, the last two speakers said, Kodesra is listening and will prioritize these research issues of agricultural transformation, youth employment, and gender relations. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, for these uh, interesting questions. Um, thank you, um, Prof. George Nzongola and Talaja, for bringing Amilka Cabral into, into this room. Um, I've actually been very energized by reading um, recently things written about agriculture from so long ago. And the thing that's so strange is nothing has changed. I mean, it just felt very odd to me, reading these things, which people don't often read because these days, scholars are taught to cite recent sources. We're always being harassed about how recent your sources are. And I, I have friends who don't cite any, any, who will not cite anything that was written before 2000. So it's, it's so important to go back to these sources because I think they tell us uh, where, where we've actually, how far we've actually not, not come. And, and so um, I definitely want to associate myself with um, the points that uh, Cabral was making about what should be the purposes of agriculture and the importance of uh, food production, but also the importance of maintaining skills. Because there's something very sad going on about intergenerational transfer of skills. Um, a lot of people complain about the age of farmers. That has become a, a, a new topic in discussions of, of African agriculture, that farmers are aging, they don't have the energy to work anymore, and their children have, have voted uh, uh, with, with their feet. And it's, um, it, it's become very clear that one also needs to understand what it is that young people are telling us about agriculture. because. My work in the Ghanaian countryside shows that actually there are a lot of young people involved in farming, but they farm for different purposes. Sometimes they farm to gain capital to go into small-scale mining, or, or they farm so that they can collect money to travel or do some, 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 some other thing. So, but basically what it is, is, is that it signifies the big crisis of um, agrarian labor, that labor does, is not re reproducing itself, and people would rather not do anything than, than, than to go and farm for, 
for, for, for next to nothing. So, so thank you for, for bringing um, up, up these issues, as well as a point about um, the, the destruction of colonial structures. I guess that's a, that's a very tall and, and big agenda because we have people who thrive in, <laughs> in these uh, colonial structures, who are invested in them, who've become um, basically the supporters of certain relations which, which benefit them and, and not, not, not their population. In terms of Cordestria and my solutions, um, um, Cordestria is a listening organization. <laughs> That's my experience of, of Cordestria. But uh, the president doesn't have powers to determine Cordestria's research agenda. <laughs> so I can use my, my standing here to deliver this lecture to, to push an agenda. It's up to the entire scientific community, including yourself, to say, this is priority, let's do it, or the president is mistaken, let's ignore her. And in a few days, you have a new president, so maybe that's a person to go and start <laughs> <laughs> pressing our case to. <laughs> um, I, I got this question about endogenous um, knowledge. Actually, I didn't ignore that. In my discussion on climate change, I did make the point that um, African farmers have long used technologies based on indigenous knowledge, which has been very useful for smallholder agriculture, like the long fallow periods that were condemned as the waste of land, the soil convers conservation methods that they've used, seed renewal technologies, and so on. All these things are about end endogenous knowledge. I did not talk about handicrafts because we were talking about farming and, and farming technologies, but it's not um, out of a, a lack of support for indigenous knowledge and, and technologies. It's very much something that we should pay attention to because there's a notion of African smallholders which is very at odds with who they are. I remember um, doing field work in, 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 in Ashanti region and coming upon a meeting of farmers that had been called by Mondelez, which is a, a transnational corporation that buys cocoa. And, and also trains farmers and has all sorts of welfare things for them. In fact, I, I, I keep on saying that Mondelez is the government in the countryside, not, not the, the national government. And these, we, so we, we approached these farmers and wanted to talk to them. And they would not let me listen because all of them were trying to tell me what they wanted me to know about agriculture. These are very... Um, vibrant and knowledgeable people. They are very clued about all sorts of things. All their decisions are very rational. And last but not least, they are business people. They've been business people since the colonial period. And yet we're always talking about, oh, subsistence farmers, we have to change farming from a way of life into a business. What do we mean, actually mean by that? I think um, it's actu it actually has to do with the fact that many of us do not spend enough time in the countryside. So we have this strange notion of what people are up to uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the countryside. So, so definitely, um, th this, this is, um, this is a, a very important issue, and, and I think uh, we need to understand better what it is that, that, that farmers uh, are up to. I got a question about um, land tenure, land ownership, communal ownership, titling and registration, and so on. Um, as usual, there's an interesting debate in the literature about whether you need to privatize, um, people need land titling for agriculture to work in, 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 in Africa. And obviously, people are lined, on, are lined up on either side. Some people saying you need private ownership. Some people saying it's not proven that the cocoa farmers uh, turned Ghana into the leading producer of cocoa on customary ownership of land. And I think there's something in there. I think the point we are all trying to strive for is security of tenure and a certainty that nobody will take your land from you, no matter what terms on which uh, you, ha you have the land. There's also the experience of titling and registration to pay attention to because it's tended not to deliver what people expect it to deliver. Kenya is a poster child of an early process of land titling and registration. Their land um, registry is always out of date. There are all sorts of uh, strange things going on. It's fueling land concentration and, 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 and so on. So I think what we should ask ourselves is how to secure land for people so that they do not feel insecure. And people have said that possession is 99% of ownership. 
it is that we have to pay attention to the, um, to the developments which are creating a lot of uncertainty in holdings and keep on pushing people off land. And the pretext people use to take land from, from, from people who are using uh, the land. As to the business about uh, credit, it's a very interesting point we raise. Interestingly, the majority of smallholders do not take loans from the bank. They take loans from private people who often charge them 100% interest and all sorts of um, terrible terms. I think what we need to pay attention to is actually the regulation of, 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 of microcredit. We are not doing enough to pay attention to the terms on which people are operating um, credit systems in, in, in the countryside, and we need to pay attention to that. Uh, certain banks will never lend to smallholders whether or not they, they have title. One approach has been that farmers think about all sorts of cooperatives, producer cooperatives, cooperatives to sell um, their produce, um, co credit cooperatives, all sorts of things. And whilst cooperatives are quite a bad name in, in, in African ag agricultural systems a long time ago, perhaps it's time to take a look at them again, I, given what has happened with this notion that farmers want to uh, work on their own and they do not need to cooperate with, 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 with anyone. Um, there's a question about uh, CADIP and African uh, policy makers and the, and the intelligentsia. This is um, another thorny um, area in thinking about uh, policy engagements and their, their outcomes. Researchers do, do research and for this research to reach policymakers has never been a straightforward thing. The question is that who do African policymakers pay attention to? It seems to be that often high profile um, non-Africans get a, the kind of hearing and access that African um, scholars ne never get. There was a time when De Soto was walking around this continent talking about dead capital and how we should title all the land and so that farmers can realize their capital. Jeffrey Sachs, there are all sorts of people. Whatever they say becomes gospel. And that's why I was giving you the example of that Oxford Center for African Economics. I'm certain that that article by Dercon and his friend is going to carry much more weight than anything that you or I have to say to, 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 um, to our policymakers on, on this continent. So that's one thing that has to change. And, and it is not up to one person. It is up to all of us to see what we do. But definitely, there's more power on one side. A policymaker can decide to listen or not to listen. And, and um, when they do listen and when they are thoughtful, I think good things do, do, uh, do, do happen in the policy world. So we, we need to pay some attention to that. Um, the question of urban land scarcity and urban land hunger is a huge issue. I didn't mention it because I was talking about um, the agrarian sector. And clearly that's a, a, a limitation in my discussion because there's urban farming going on and I think my colleague from Zimbabwe um, mentioned that. So it's important to look at um, the, 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 land, the, the, the land challenges of, of urban farming because sometimes people doing urban farming have resorted to that also because they've left rural areas, they have farming skills, they want to be close to um, urban areas because of the kinds of possibilities that, that, that might give to them. And then they have to depend on, on, on these kinds of, of lands. It's not an area in which I have expertise, so I, I, I will leave <coughs> that point at that. But to say that I think it's a, it's a very important issue. I've seen studies from South Africa being done by Ricardo Jacobs and, 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 and others on, on urban agriculture, and, and, and I think it will be good to, to, take a, to take a good look at it. Um, and thank you, um, Zen, for, 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 for your contribution about why it is that we do not pay um, attention to, to agriculture. And, and I guess my response to this is that statistics don't tell us a lot. If you look at the statistics on agriculture, there, there appears to be nothing going on there. It's just going down and stagnating and so on. It's strange when you do field work in, in the countryside to see this really seething place of all sorts of contestations, strategies, and, 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 and so on. And, and I always come away very, very energized by, by who you meet and what they, what they talk about and the, the strategies they're engaged in. But also the way they look at their options and the ways they relate to the state 
are very interesting um, uh, to me. And, and I feel that um, once we begin to engage with this um, sector in a very serious way, it will begin to, we'll get past the story of stagnation and past the story of productivity and begin to engage in, in, in looking or, or witnessing and, and chronicling change in a way that makes a difference to our people. So thank you very much. Now, en uh, seu nome, gostaria de agradecer a Presidente por sua estimulante e informativa uh, palestra. Uh, profa, muito obrigado. <laughs> Shukran. <laughs> Merci. Thank you very much. Nkolofowe has out, outdone me completely <laughs> with his linguistic skills. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, uh, I know it's late. I know you are tired. Uh, but I want to beg your indulgence because I have one little thing I need to do. And uh, your presence is absolutely important to the little thing I want to do. I once did this to the executive committee that I served on earlier on once did this to bio. And uh, having lived under military regime, he was unable to figure out that uh, we were up to something. So I want to confess I've been up to something. Been up to something. Something good though. <laughs> Each time you come to Dakar, or you go to a Kodesria event anywhere, and it goes well, you all come and congratulate me. Say how well it's organized. Actually, I've already received quite a number of congratulations since Monday. What you don't know is that there are people who do this work. All I do is to get them to do the work. If it goes well, I get all the congratulations. If it doesn't go well, I get the blame. But most of the time, I get the congratulations. And so I thought I should take this evening, just a little bit of your time, because in 2019, there are several members of staff of Codesria who will be retiring. And these are members of staff of Codesria whom I've been working with preparing for the General Assembly. And I couldn't think of the best way to thank them. I couldn't think of anything that I could give them other than to thank them during this occasion. And I've spoken to His Excellency, President Tambombeki, and just a handshake with him will do it for me, at least. <laughs> so I would like to ask His Excellency to come up just for a minute. Having been in the ANC, he knows how to do underground things, so I really, <laughs> I, 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 I had an ally in this. And he already knows. Uh, Marinjai. <laughs> Marinjai has served the council for 31 years. And I, I do not know anyone in Kodesria community who doesn't know Marinjai. No, I know and so, Marie, we wanted to take this opportunity to thank you very much. 
and uh, to wish you very well and to use this occasion to brand ourselves in your house um, because I know you love Cordesria and I know you've been dedica you have dedicated your life to Cordesria. So thank you very much for allowing us. Okay. I think we should bring in the next uh, person. Can, can I have John Pierre? By, by, by the way, they, they, they thought they were going to have a meeting with the executive secretary. Uh, John Pierre has served Codestria for 31 years. That there is no publication of Codestria that John Pierre doesn't know. And anybody who has come to the Codestria Institutes has definitely interacted with John Pierre. So, John Pierre, this is uh, our word of gratitude to you. We want to brand your, ourselves in your house, and we thank you very much uh, for serving the council for 31 years. Is someone hiding somewhere? The Grand Baji. Osman Baji. I know he's somewhere. Mariam, can I have Baji? Emilian, can I have Baji? Meantime, let me have uh, Dauda. Dauda has served the council for 38 years. And, and there is no Codestria publication that has not passed in his hands. Dauda, we wanted to thank you very much for the service to the council. We really do appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Edgar. Edgar has served the council for 35 years. I, I, I want to add, I want to add that there are 
numerous printing equipment, printing machines that have become obsolete in the council, but, Dauda, uh, but uh, Edgar has been around for all that time. <laughs> and, and the most interesting part is this. This is his last week in Codestria. <laughs> this last week. Thank you very much. Monsieur Fall. Safal has served the council for 10 years. <laughs> Anybody who has passed through Codestria has definitely seen Mr. Fall. We want to thank you very much yes. for your contribution to the council. Thank you. Amadou Diop. Amadou has served the council for 34 years. And Amadou is the one who gives out the money. So there's even dupe dollars in Codestria. Thank, thank you very much, Amadou, for your service to the council. Unfortunately, Mr. Baji is not around, so we will do a mini ceremony in the council, uh, or if possible, tomorrow morning, if His Excellency is around. But I want to thank you, Your Excellency, for doing this for us. <laughs> really appreciate it. And thank you very much, everyone, for the presence, I'll ask. Uh, uh, okay, uh, please, uh, they request a photo with you. Uh, so. Please. I think it will be a nice photo on the walls of Codestria anyway. <laughs> so it's a really good idea. <laughs> Please come. Uh, for those others who are wondering, His Excellency has agreed to take a uh, a conference photo with all of us tomorrow and we are going to make an announcement what time we are doing it. So please let's give them the chance to take this photo here. Thank you very much.
please. Uh, I will ask, uh, it should be a nice photo between Zen and uh, Edgar. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll ask Ato to make some announcements before we leave. Good evening, colleagues. Um, kindly, before you go, tomorrow we are going to move into parallel sessions. Colleagues, please, can we kindly be seated? This is a very important uh, uh, announcement. We are moving into parallel sessions tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, we have only 24 hours in a day. The fact that you feel like you need to make a few more points will not add more minutes or hours to the time that we have for tomorrow. So please, please respect the time. Remember that if you go beyond your time, you are not just taking time somewhere. You are still in the time of the people who are supposed to come after you. Uh, so please respect the time. It's very important because the hotel has fixed times for tea breaks and for lunch. It will be good if we all get out of the rooms at the same time, right on time. Have our breaks and go back into the rooms. We have about four sessions in each of the rooms, so please let's respect the time. There will be two colleagues from Codestria trying to police to make sure that we stay within the time limit. So please, um, let's, um, let's be open to their, their suggestions. The second point, there are some of you whose sessions are supposed to be in the room C12. Room C12. There won't be any more sessions. There won't be sessions anymore in room C12. They have been moved to Salon Saint Louis. Huh? Or in English, you read Saint Louis. Huh? The Saint Louis room. Salon Saint Louis. Okay, tomorrow we'll have signs and we'll have people directing you. But if you're in C12, you are now in Salon Saint Louis. The third point. There is going to be a film screening on Professor Samir Amin in this room, beginning at 7.30 today. Remember, it is optional. This is important. For those of you who don't stay in this hotel, your bosses are outside right now, waiting to take you to your hotels. If you decide to stay for the film, you'll have to make your own way to the hotels. Remember, the hotels are not far from here. Huh? Fleur de Lis, um, Yas, they are just up the road. So if you just walk a bit, you'll get to the hotel. Huh? You've been sitting all day, so I guess a little bit of exercise won't kill you. <laughs> now, the final announcement. There are a few of you that have sessions in room B12. In the program, we've listed the session as 4 o'clock to 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. The panel is chaired by Pulen Lenkabula, and it has Josephine Oshiel, Samuel Oyewole, Miracle Ajay, and Mokua Umbati. There is, there is a typographical error. Your panel actually begins at 4.30 and ends at 6.30, along with all of the fourth um, panels that are going to happen tomorrow. So your, hap your panel will happen after the second tea break. It will still be in room B12. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Some music from Mr. Falk as we leave. <laughs>